Letters to a Young Poet by Rainer Maria Rilke Letter number three Via Reggio, near Pisa, Italy April 23rd, 1903 You gave me much pleasure, dear sir, with your Easter letter for it brought much good news of you and the way you spoke about Jacobson's great and beloved art showed me that I was not wrong to guide your life and its many questions to this abundance. Now... Neil's line will open to you a book of splendors and depths. The more often one reads it, the more everything seems to be contained within it, from life's most imperceptible fragrances to the full, enormous taste of its heaviest fruits. In it, there is nothing that does not seem to have been understood, held, lived, and known in memory's wavering echo. No experience has been too unimportant and the smallest event unfolds like a fate, and fate itself is like a wonderful wide fabric in which every thread is guided by an infinitely tender hand and laid alongside another thread and is held and supported by a hundred others. You will experience the great happiness of reading this book for the first time and will move through its numberless surprises as if you were in a new dream. But I can tell you that, even later on, one moves through these books again and again with the same astonishment and that they lose none of their wonderful power and relinquish none of their overwhelming enchantment that they had the first time one read them. One just comes to enjoy them more and more, becomes more and more grateful and somehow better and simpler in one's vision, deeper in one's faith in life, happier and greater in the way one lives. And later on, you will have to read the wonderful book of the fate and yearning of Marie Grubb and Jacobson's letters and journals and fragments and finally his verses which even if they are just moderately well translated, live in infinite sound. For this reason, I would advise you to buy, when you can, the lovely complete edition of Jacobson's works, which contains all of these. It is in three volumes, well translated, published by Eugene Diederichs in Leipzig and costs, I think, only five or six marks per volume. In your opinion of roses should have been here, that work of such incomparable delicacy and form, you are, of course, quite, quite incontestably right, as against the man who wrote the introduction, but let me make this request right away. Read as little as possible of literary criticism. Such things are either partisan opinions which have become petrified and meaningless, hardened and empty of life, or else they are clever word games in which one view wins, and tomorrow the opposite view. Works of art are of an infinite solitude, and no means of approach is so useless as criticism. Only love can touch and hold them and be fair to them. Always trust yourself in your own feeling, as opposed to argumentation, discussions, or introductions of that sort. If it turns out that you are wrong, then the natural growth of your inner life will eventually guide you to other insights. Allow your judgments their own silent, undisturbed development, which, like all progress, must come from deep within and cannot be forced or hastened. Everything is gestation and then birthing. To let each impression and each embryo of a feeling come to completion entirely in itself, in the dark, in the unsayable, the unconscious, beyond the reach of one's own understanding, and with deep humility and patience to wait for the hour when a new clarity is born. This alone is what it means to live as an artist, in understanding as in creating. In this, there is no measuring with time. A year doesn't matter, and ten years are nothing. Being an artist means not numbering and counting, but ripening, like a tree, which doesn't force its sap, and stands confidently in the storms of spring, not afraid that afterward summer may not come. It does come, but it comes only to those who are patient, who are there as if eternity lay before them, so unconcernedly silent and vast. I learn it every day of my life. Learn it with pain I am grateful for. Patience is everything. 
Richard Demel, my experience with his books, and also incidentally with the man, whom I know slightly, is that whenever I have discovered one of his beautiful pages, I am always afraid that the next one will destroy the whole effect and change what is admirable into something unworthy. You have characterized him quite well with the phrase, living and writing in heat. And in fact, the artist's experience lies so unbelievably close to the sexual, to its pain and its pleasure, that the two phenomena are really just different forms of one and the same longing and bliss. And if instead of heat, one could say sex, sex in the great, pure sense of the word, free of any sin attached to it by the church, then his art would be very great and infinitely important. His poetic power is great, and as strong as a primal instinct, it has its own relentless rhythms in itself, and explodes from him like a volcano. But this power does not always seem completely straightforward and without pose. But that is one of the most difficult tests for the creator. He must always remain unconscious, unaware of his best virtues, if he doesn't want to rob them of their candor and innocence. And then, When thundering through his being, it arrives at the sexual, it finds someone who is not so pure as it needs him to be. Instead of a completely ripe and pure world of sexuality, it finds a world that is not human enough, that is only male, is heat, thunder, and restlessness, and burdened with the old prejudice and arrogance with which the male has always disfigured and burdened love. Because he only loves as a male and not as a human being. There is something narrow in his sexual feeling, something that seems wild, malicious, time-bound, uneternal, which diminishes his art and makes it ambiguous and doubtful. It is not immaculate. It is marked by time and by passion, and little of it will endure. But most art is like that. Even so, one can deeply enjoy what is great in it, Only one must not get lost in it and become a hanger-on of Demel's world, which is so infinitely afraid, filled with adultery and confusion, and is far from the real fates which make one suffer more than these time-bound afflictions do, but also give one opportunity for greatness and more courage for eternity. Finally, as to my own books... I wish I could send you any of them that might give you pleasure, but I am very poor and my books, as soon as they are published, no longer belong to me. I can't even afford them myself, and as I would so often like to give them to those who would be kind to them. So, I am writing for you, on another slip of paper, the titles and publishers of my most recent books, the newest ones, all together I publish perhaps twelve or thirteen, and must leave to you, dear sir, to order one or two of them when you can. I am glad that my books will be in your hands. With best wishes, yours, Reiner Maria Rilke.